You guys tell me. <laughs> well, good morning. Could you uh, kick the, uh, just briefly, thanks, that helps. Echo, echo, you, echo. They echo. have this wonderful effects on our soundboard, and like when they're on, you can hear your head, it's, like, it's echoing in my head. It's echoing in my brain. Um, hey, we're excited everybody's here today. Um, and welcome to those of you who are joining us via Facebook Live, um, and we're excited to worship together this morning. Um, let me see if I can get all of the announcements that we have this morning. Uh, and so I'm going to ask for help from um, from Stacy, from others that are sitting here. So I know coming up we have a um, a camping retreat that's scheduled. It's an overnight uh, in May. It's May. Oh, April 30th. Okay, April 30th, May 1st, but you can also stay on the 29th, and it's at Devil's Den. Um, and so check in on the website, probably some information there for you. Cool. Uh, the other thing, too, is our table groups have started up. We have table groups running all over town multiple days a week, and uh, so it's not too late. Um, I think some of them just got started. Some of them are even virtual. So I think Laura and, and Tim are hosting one uh, in the afternoons on Friday at lunchtime. So that's kind of a convenient time if you can't make it in the evening. So lots of options there. We're really having fun. Our group uh, met for the first time, and it was it was fun. We had a lot of folks show up and ate some good food and enjoyed that. So find your way into a table group. That way you can uh, get to know some folks uh, uh, that you may not have had a chance to meet. Uh, they're only running for a short time, uh, and then we'll reshuffle and do it again, so that way we can get a chance to, to know one another a little bit better. Um, what am I missing? Anything else? Is that is that it? Well, uh, normally, uh, oh yeah, John and John and Jane are traveling. Uh, they're actually down in uh, Mexico, or they were. They built a house. If you follow them on social media, you saw some of the pictures of the family that they built for. That was really cool. And then today he's speaking at the Ecclesia Church, which is in California. That's one of the churches that support them. So we can be, you know, we can be praying for them, uh, for them this morning. Uh, is there other things that, uh, as we get started this morning? I want to pray for us. I want to pray for things that are going on in the world, um, and then we'll we'll uh, segue into the Lord's Prayer. Anything we need to be lifting up this morning? Is anybody popping in with anything on the, on the feed there? All right, well, I, I'm going to go ahead and then and just uh, pray, and then I'm going to uh, lead us into a time uh, with the saying, saying the Lord's Prayer together, and then we'll... You know, Go right into our music. Let's let's stand together and pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this morning. As we gather together and uh, to be reminded of who you are, that you're at the center of everything, to be to to be remembered, to be brought back together again, and to be reminded as well that worship, our time together this morning, is meant to be the anecdote of selfishness. It's sort of a reordering of a power where ours lessens and yours grows. It's a reordering of our life. And so, God, we pray this morning that as we come together and worship, that we're reminded of the community, the coming together, the reordering of our collective lives, and that we are given a kingdom glimpse of what unity looks like put ourselves aside. God, I pray this morning for our friends and others in the Ukraine that are struggling right now, Father. 1.5 million refugees that are winding their way away from the fighting and trying to find a new place. God, I pray that the hearts of those that are in and around them, their homes are opened, Father, that they have a place to stay. God, I pray that, um, Lord, that we will... Um, also be just re reminded of the sovereignty that you have, God, in our lives and that the, the peace and, and uh, things that can come as a result of, of knowing you more. And I pray that, Father, for those, again, that are, that are just struggling in life, God, those that, that may not have a meal, for those who may not have relationships, and that we uh, ourselves, God, are great, grateful as we are reminded of the 
those things that we do have. So, Father, we pray this morning uh, together with you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not, Lord, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stay standing. Oh, 
My name is Laura Holland, and I am a member of the teaching team here. Jennifer, is this okay? Perfect. Um, and I need you to know that I just really struggled not to dance and do the like arm movements from back in youth group days through the entire thing. I was feeling it. I was doing it in my heart. I just needed to know I was doing them in my heart. So the 2013 romantic comedy About Time is about a guy named Tim, who on his 21st birthday finds out that the men in his family have this ability to travel back in time to relive moments of their life. When his dad tells him about this gift, he encourages him to not use it for things like going back in time to win the lottery or to try to become famous, but instead to use it to really get the most out of each day. And not just to get the most out of each day, but to really improve the relationships around him. At 21, Tim hears this, and the only relationship he's really concerned about at that moment are romantic ones, hence the romantic comedy. So that's what we, we see. We see those hijinks. But as he grows up, throughout the movie, Tim jumps back in time, reliving these special moments and these days and events, using the knowledge from his first time through to make changes to improve them the second time through. He also seeks to improve the lives of those around him through this gift. So if something bad happens to someone he cares for, he goes back to try to fix it. Eventually, though, a little, a little like mini spoiler, but this movie's been out for almost 10 years. So eventually, he discovers that he can't intervene to fix everything. It's just not an option. 
because some things must happen. But when those things happen, it is often the beginning of the great things to come. So for those of us who aren't 21-year-old British guys named Tim who have the ability to time travel, as much as we might wish for the ability to do that, to be able to have some redos, that's not the way that life works. For us, we can't hop back into time for the restoration from a redo. We have to rely on each other. Because in a cyclical, symbiotic way, my restoration is aided by your commitment to following Jesus. Because sometimes, if we pay attention, we might realize that we're receiving the exact restoration that we longed for. It just might not look how we expected it to. But through relationship, maybe over a meal, we're given opportunities for restoration that act as de facto do-overs. And those set the foundation for us to step fully into our calling. We've been looking at stories through this series that take place around a table or over a meal. And part of that is to provide context for why, as Grace, we're doing table groups, which Alex was just, just sharing about. And over the past few weeks, John has discussed several ways through these conversations over a meal that Jesus has addressed societal expectations by recasting a vision of society that is focused on him. So in other words, when we're in Jesus, the traditional roles and related expectations fall away and are reimagined in a way that centers who Jesus is, who Jesus says we are, and what Jesus calls us to do. With the story of Mary and Martha, we saw him reassigning the role of women and the way that women relate to each other, how we relate to them, the whole interaction, but it wasn't about women because effectively that meant that all of society was overhauled. Similarly, last week with the story of the Last Supper, we saw Jesus reimagining the role of servants and what it means to serve which once again didn't just impact those serving, but it created a whole new way to relate to one another. So this week again, we're going to talk about another broadening of this reimagined society. The story that we're gonna read takes place after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and after Jesus has already appeared to Mary Magdalene in the garden and appeared twice to the 12 disciples. It's the final chapter of the book of John, and unlike those Jesus sightings that I just mentioned, which all took place in Jerusalem, we're told that our story today takes place on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. This is the place where it all started. So two important reimaginings come out of this story. So let's take a look. It's John 21, 1 through 19. After this, this being the events that we just listed, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, also called the Sea of Galilee. Now this is how he did so. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel, who was from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Debedee, Zebedee and two other disciples of his were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. We'll go with you, they replied. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When it was already very early morning, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you don't have any fish, do, do you? They replied, no. He told them, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they threw the net and were not able to pull it in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. So Simon Peter, when he heard that it was the Lord, tucked in his outer garment where he had nothing on underneath it and plunged into the sea. Meanwhile, the other disciples came with the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards. When they got to the beach, they saw a charcoal fire ready with a fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've just now caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153. But although there were so many, the net was not torn. Come have breakfast, Jesus said. 
But none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now this was the third time Jesus had been revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Then when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these do? He replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus told him, feed my lambs. Jesus said a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Simon told him, shepherd my sheep. Jesus said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus replied, feed my sheep. I tell you the solemn truth. When you were young, you tied your clothes around you and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and others will tie you up and bring you where you do not want to go. Now, Jesus said this to indicate clearly by what kind of death Peter was going to glorify God. After he said this, Jesus told Peter, follow me. So this is a story with a lot of details, some scene changes. Like there's a lot packed into these 19 verses. And you might have noticed while listening that in our story today, there are several parallels to other table-centered stories that we've already discussed in this series. The Last Supper becomes this breakfast that Jesus prepares where he breaks the bread for the disciples. He adds fish to this meal and the disciples this time around are able to realize just how precious this time with Jesus is. And there's a parallel to the miraculous multiplication of fish that we saw in the feeding of the 5,000. But this time we have 153 fish for the seven disciples were told were fishing that day. And there are a few other parallels of stories that we haven't discussed, but are likely familiar with many of you that you might have picked up on while we were reading through this passage. One of those parallels is where we ended our reading today with an exchange that started with Simon Peter being distressed and ended with him once again receiving a picture of a new way to engage that was centered on who Jesus is, who Jesus said he was, and on what Jesus was calling him to do. We typically save the personal application portion for the end, but I want to say clearly up front that although it's typically wise to cast ourselves in the role of town person number three when we are reading scripture. This time I think we're at safe imagining ourselves more in the role of Simon Peter to imagine that we're receiving this reminder of our identity, that we're the ones being commissioned and that we're being called to live lives centered around Christ. So I implore you to listen with that understanding of this personal invitation within this. John's provided modern day versions of most of the stories in this series. So I'm going to stick to that general theme, but instead of a modern day rendition, I'm going to give you the Laura paraphrase of this story. So as I read it, you'll have another chance to listen with those two elements in mind, the parallel stories and Simon Peter's commissioning. So I give you the Laura paraphrase of John 21. Simon Peter and six more of Jesus's disciples were hanging out back near home near the Sea of Galilee, when Peter decided he wanted to go fishing and invited the others along. They went out at night, the typical time to fish, and despite their combined experience as fishermen, they didn't catch a thing. As they were heading back in the morning, they heard someone they couldn't quite make out shout to them from the shore. The seeming stranger, after noting that they didn't have any fish, suggested to them that they try again. But this time, the wrong time of day, in the wrong part of the lake to actually catch anything, and with a super specific instruction to throw the net on the right side. None of this makes sense, but they did what the stranger told them. After taking this really terrible advice, they actually ended up catching a ton of fish, so much so that they couldn't even pull up the net, which they then had to awkwardly hold on to so that they didn't release these fish back in as they were coming to shore. It was then that John, the disciple who loved reminding everyone just how much Jesus liked him, 
realized it was actually Jesus on shore. Now this makes sense. No wonder this worked out because Jesus is in the miracle business. So when Peter heard John declare that it was the Lord, he dove into the water and swam to shore. He could not contain himself, even though the boat he was on was also heading that direction. We don't know what the faster choice was. That's something we'll never know. But once they all got to shore, they saw that Jesus had set up breakfast for them. To make it even better, they just needed to bring over some of the fish that they just caught so they could have a feast. Like almost 20 pieces of fish per person kind of feast. I did the math. So they sat. Jesus broke the bread and served them, then served them the fish. For being the Messiah, Jesus really liked serving others. After they ate, Jesus called Simon Peter to the side and proceeded to ask him the same question three times. Do you love me? Each time, Simon Peter got a bit more antsy. This was kind of an awkward conversation because they hadn't really had a one-on-one heart-to-heart since Peter had denied Jesus three times right before the crucifixion. But this made it all the more important that Jesus heard and trusted Simon Peter's answer each time he declared, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. After the first round, Jesus told Simon Peter, Remember to take care of those I have called you to. Take care of the poor, the widows, the orphans, the least of these. The second time, he said, Don't just take care of them. Invite them into your life. Truly care for them as one of your own. And then the third time, feed them. Please don't ignore their physical needs in favor of only addressing spiritual needs because they can't hear what you're saying if they are hungry and thirsty and tired. And then he ended by saying, I've been showing you how to do this for years. I have been teaching, I have been modeling, and now it's your turn to follow after me. The restorative truth of the resurrection was revealed to Simon Peter as he went about his daily life. It was in this mundane return to normal that Simon Peter was able to experience a resurrection in his own life. It was here that he was given a do-over or two previous interactions he had had with Jesus or about Jesus. In Matthew 14, we can read the story of Peter again on a boat, seeing Jesus in the distance walking towards them on water. He and the other disciples react fearfully, to which Jesus responds, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. In this interaction, this first one, Peter says, Lord, if it is you, Tell me to come to you on the water. Maybe a challenge, a hedging of his bets, a hesitant willingness. Jesus tells him to come. And Peter steps out on the water and begins to walk toward Jesus. But then becomes afraid by the wind and starts to sink. At this point, he calls out to Jesus to save him. And Jesus does and responds with, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So the last instance we have of Peter on a boat, seeing Jesus in the distance, this is the context. This is what has happened. But this time we see it play out very differently. This time we see Peter acting on faith. We see Peter acting without hesitancy other than to put on his clothes. We see Peter jumping in literally without challenging Jesus or questioning if it's him. He heard. John say, it is the Lord, and he was off, he went. We see Peter acting in a manner that might even seem a bit foolish, since a perfectly fine boat was already heading in the same direction that he decided to swim. When we take a step back and we look at it holistically, what we see is a Peter who was able to have a reimagined response to Jesus' presence in his life. The resurrection resurrected an opportunity to respond differently, and he did. Then after breakfast, 
Jesus speaks directly to Simon Peter, asking him three times if he loves him. Some in our teaching team meeting admitted that this interaction on its surface feels kind of icky. Maybe it even feels a little manipulative if we were to put ourselves into this situation. So when we come across things like this in scripture that make us think, eh, this doesn't sit quite right with me, pay attention. Like this is something to like really dig into. Write it down. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you why it doesn't sit right. What is it about it that's off? And you might find that it hits weird because you've experienced behavior like this from others in your own life. And so it's hard to trust Jesus's intentions because it just feels really familiar. You might find that it's hard because you can place yourself in Simon Peter's shoes. You can imagine being there and you can almost feel his distress at not being believed or frustration because he's having to repeat himself or maybe just a bit of anxiety and confusion, wondering if it's that he's not being clear Like, why is he not being understood? What is going on? Or is it tough to read? Because when we assign these motives or intentions to Jesus, we no longer recognize him. He no longer bears any resemblance to the Jesus we know because he isn't behaving as we've come to expect Jesus to behave. When we can peel back the layers and get to this being the source of discomfort, that this doesn't sound like Jesus, like we've hit gold. This is the good stuff because we have four books worth of Jesus's actions recorded and a Bible worth of God's character revealed. So if something seems out of character, dig in. We have the place where we are able to examine these side by side. So in this instance, we can remember the context of this conversation. Following the Last Supper and right before Jesus is crucified, we read in all four Gospels that Peter denies knowing Jesus three separate times. And this was after Jesus told him that this would happen in a conversation with Peter in the Last Supper, where Peter said, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And yet, just hours later, you're one of Jesus' disciples, right? Nope. Mm Mm-mm. You were with Jesus. Don't know him. But your accent, it gives you away. Just a weird coincidence. Three times he was asked, and three times he denied. Is it possible then that in this interaction, Jesus wasn't being manipulative, but was instead providing an opportunity for Simon Peter to come back into the fold? The disciples had already let him back in. We know this because he's in the stories with the disciples. The disciples are there on the boat fishing. The disciples have let him back in, but does Simon Peter trust it? Is Simon Peter still holding on to these concerns that maybe his restoration back in isn't real? Is he still feeling guilty? Does he still feel a bit like a fraud, some imposter syndrome going on? And were these lies that Peter could have been believing Were they fully resolved by Jesus providing three new opportunities to declare his love? And we can just ask ourselves, do we know Jesus to be manipulative or restorative? Where do you long to be restored? I also think that the fact that this conversation took place after a meal that Jesus provided and hosted might provide some helpful instructions for us. Because before dealing with the heart issue at hand, Jesus responded to the physical felt need. They had been working all night and were likely really hungry. So Jesus fed them. He didn't require Simon Peter's thrice confirmed allegiance and love as entry into the feast. He first engaged relationally and took care of their physical need. So when we hear the charge and commissioning Jesus provides Peter, feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep, feed my sheep. I want to caution us from hearing these as only figurative orders or from assuming that as Christians, our responsibility is only to people's spiritual needs. Jesus ends this portion of the conversation with Peter by saying, follow me. 
So what did we see Jesus do? He literally fed those in his care. He then provided relational, emotional, and spiritual restoration. He shepherded. He brought Simon Peter back to the flock. He reminded Peter, and by default, the disciples, of this new societal order. Their sins had been forgiven. Our sins have been forgiven. We do not need to be shunned or kept away for a wrongdoing that Jesus has already restored for us. And we certainly do not need to be shunned or kept away for a societal norm that Jesus already reimagined for us 2,000 years ago. So why do we keep recreating societal structures when Jesus has shown us over and over and over that this work has been done? Our call is to feed, to shepherd, and to follow. Is that what we're doing? Because the communal realization of this imagined, reimagined society, it relies on our individual acceptance. Jesus has widely taught on this reordered and reimagined society. And right before he ascends to heaven, he'll once again issue a broad commissioning, urging the disciples to be his witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We could read this as to Fayetteville, to Northwest Arkansas and the rest of the state and to the ends of the earth. But in this story, right here, Jesus is looking directly at Simon Peter and saying, you, you've been charged with this. Not a royal you, you. This new society, this kingdom on earth as it's done in heaven, you have a role. And this reimagined society, it's not just for women or for servants or for tax collectors or Pharisees. This is for those of you that are hungry. This is for those of you that find yourself at the end of your workday with nothing to show for it. This is for those of you who wish you could have a redo or a mulligan or a second chance. This is for you. So what does this have to do with the table, you might be asking? Everything. Because when we invite people to the table, we're remembering that this charge is for us. We're feeding the lambs. We are shepherding and restoring people to the flock. And we are restoring bodies and relationships. We're giving people second chances. And we too are restored. We're reminded that we've been given the opportunity to leap from the boat. We have been given a chance to affirm our love and to experience the rightful place receiving the broken bread for us to dine on the abundant haul of fish pulled to store for us, pulled to shore for us. We're reminding that we've been called to follow Jesus, the same Jesus who offers fish and forgiveness calls us to do the same. The the band and those who are doing communion want to come on up. In our scripture today, we saw a parallel to the Last Supper, where Jesus once again broke the bread for the disciples and provided them the opportunity to be restored, to be remembered. And today we're doing the same. This is also the time that we remember that nobody is without need and that everyone has something to give. So this is an opportunity to give. As we prepare for communion, we're going to transition into a a time of reflection. I encourage you to think where you long for restoration, where you might be wishing for a redo, for a chance to go back in time and relive. To think about who you can feed. Once this is prepared, we'll come up how we have the last couple of weeks. You know, just come up when you are ready. Provide some some space, six feet between, you know, different groups. Um, just take communion when you have it, when you're ready. Thanks.
Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours, yours are the eyes by which he sees, the feet with which he walks, the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours, yours are the eyes by which he sees. The feet by which he walks, and the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the Before me, 
the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. My God, where here I go, glory. Where I reap and where I sow, glory. When my hand it grips the thorn, glory. In the still and in the storm, glory. Glory, oh, we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one. Oh, we labor unto glory until God's kingdom come. The sun it shines and then goes down. Pours and beats the ground, glory. The dust it blows and ends my days, glory. And hearts they burn beneath your gaze, glory. Glory. Oh, we labor unto glory. Heaven and earth are one. Oh, we labor unto glory until God's kingdom comes. Oh, we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one. Oh, we labor unto glory until God's kingdom comes. Heart, my hands, their kingdom bound, glory. Where thorns no longer curse the ground, glory. They trim the wick and light the flame, glory. Work that will not be in vain, glory. Glory, oh, we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one. Oh, we labor unto glory until God's kingdom comes. Oh, we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one. Oh, we labor unto glory. Until God's kingdom come. Amen. Let's stand as we share in the benediction with Tim.
God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. Some call me the gangster of love. Some people call me Maurice. Speak of the covenant of love. You're the same that I have when you see. See where 